Today our oral history of Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine continues with Dr. Paul A. Stern, who is professor and chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology. And I think it's very appropriate that we have Dr. Stern as our guest today because this year marks the 20th anniversary of the founding of the Department of Anesthesiology at Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine. Dr. Stern, I would like for you to begin a little bit by telling us a little bit about what transpired 20 years ago, which uh, prompted the founding of our Department of Anesthesiology, and a little bit about what has transpired over the years that has brought our department to the distinguished place where we have now in the curriculum of Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, 20 years ago, I was recruited by Dr. Joel Alter to head up the anesthesiology department at the school. The school was then a private institution. Uh, we were housed in the bowling alley, which no longer exists. Uh, almost all the faculty were volunteer faculty members. I know I was, and all the members of my department were volunteers. The course we provided at that time was a rather simple course. It consisted of uh, 21 one-hour lecture periods, standard uh, stand-up lecture for 50 minutes. In 1977, after the school became a uh, state-supported uh, institution, I was recruited by Dr. Willard, the uh, president of the school, uh, to head up the department again, and I came on full-time uh, at TCOM, uh, leaving my practice in Dallas Osteopathic Hospital. In um, 1978, I attended a course at Harvard uh, Medical School on course design. I was not pleased with the way we taught anesthesiology then and I didn't know how to change it. At the same time, Dr. Hyman Kahn uh, joined my department. I recruited him. And our course was then devoted to teaching the basics of safe patient care in anesthesiology. The next year, we changed the format of the course so that the course now consisted of eight two-hour class periods there was an audiovisual program that the students were required to prepare for the class. Uh, when they came to class, there was a short period of slide identification of pertinent slides in the program, and that was followed by a short lecture by one of the faculty members. In the second hour of the class, the class broke up into four some, and in later years into five small groups, each with a faculty member to facilitate the program. And in the second hour, there were special study questions that were reviewed by the students and the facilitator. And also it gave the facilitator an opportunity to meet with small groups and to answer any of the questions that they might have had left over from the program. The course also provided for elective rotations, which were one-month programs at the uh, local affiliated hospitals. And this was uh, very popular with students. A great number of students uh, uh, took this elective rotation, anywhere from 20 to 25 percent per class year. Uh, the course itself has always received uh, high student evaluations in the, the Student Satisfactory Index. I would say in the last 10 years, uh, our course has been in the upper 10% of all the student evaluations. And in the last five years, our course has been listed as either number one or two by students. In 1980, at the instance of Dr. Willard, the clinical faculty were asked to develop school-based residency programs. And uh, our department developed the first uh, program, AOA-approved program, at the school. It was also the first school-based anesthesiology program in the osteopathic profession. Uh, it's approved by 
the uh, AOA and the American Osteopathic College of Anesthesiologists. And the, we developed a consortium to provide the instruction at Fort Worth Osteopathic Medical Center, Dallas Family Hospital, Northeast Community Hospital, uh, Dallas Memorial Hospital. The program at that time was a two-year program following a year of internship. We also incorporated in the program a four-month rotation at uh, Baylor Medical College in Houston for high-risk obstetric training and also for uh, cardiovascular anesthesia for a sur um, major surgery there. And then we also provided a two-month rotation at Denver Children's Hospital for pediatric anesthesia. In 1986, uh, the residency was changed to a three-year program and uh, at the same time, we had a new president, Dr. Richards, who asked me to change the funding of the program. Uh, since its inception, funding of the program had been through the uh, participating hospitals and through the generosity of Dr. Willard through his uh, Institutional Development Fund. We never did receive any state funding of our program. Uh, with the budgetary constraints when Dr. Richards came on, we had to then uh, develop our own funding process, which we did, and uh, we have continued that since then, uh, leaving the school out of the business of funding the Department of Anesthesiology Residency Program. The residency, when we started uh, back in 1980, uh, was approved for 10. We had two residents to start with, and we have gradually increased that until in the last five years, six years, we have been funded for seven residents. The um, program has been rather successful. Our residents do well on the uh, certification examinations, and men, many of them are now practicing in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We have had, uh, early in our career, uh, small research proje projects. Uh, we had three programs that Dr. Khan supervised, and uh, I did uh, one program with the Department of Pharmacology on anesthetic mechanisms. The uh, department has been involved also with the ACLS program the Advanced Cardiac Life Support Program since 1979, which our department uh, instituted and then turned over to the Department of Emergency Medicine when it came on. Okay, let's go back a little further in regard to the profession in Texas. I understand that you are the very first residency trained anesthesiologist to practice in the state. Is that correct? I am the first osteopathic the trained resident in the state of Texas. Uh, and I was a founder member of the uh, Osteopathic Society of Anesthesiologists and also of the American Osteopathic College of Anesthesiologists. And then when we had our own certifying board established, at that same time I took my exams and I now have certificate number three, which uh, I guess was, uh, I don't remember way back. <laughs> okay, what other positions have you held with the American Osteopathic College of Anesthesiologists? I know you've had several honors and positions over the years in that organization. I have been a member of their Board of Governors. I've been a, the president of the uh, uh, College of Anesthesiologists. I've been uh, parliamentarian. I was appointed to the uh, certifying board, the American Osteopathic Board of Anesthesiology, and I stayed in that position for almost eight, nine years, uh, which was, I was uh, mainly concerned with the uh, questions and the process for certification, not so much with the details of the, who's, who, who does get the exam or who doesn't. My big contribution to that was that I helped throw out many of the questions 
uh, because I found them improper and archaic. Um, I am currently, at this time, still a consultant to the American Osteopathic Board of Anesthesiology. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that I have helped uh, in uh, getting members of our department into positions of responsibility, both in the College of Anesthesiologists and the Board of Anesthesiology uh, since my time there and uh, uh, up to this time currently, including yourself. Dr. Gallagher was a member of the Board of Governors of the College of Anesthesiologists. Dr. Kahn is a member of the Board of Anesthesiology. Dr. Stephen Stern is now a member of the Board of Anesthesiology, having previously been a member of the Board of, uh, uh, of the uh, College of Anesthesiologists. So we, we are maintaining our continuity and our, what should we say, our influence on the profession through the school. I know you received a number of awards from the American Osteopathic College of Anesthesiologists. I know you've given the Crawford Estraline Memorial Lecture one year, and I also know that you received this Distinguished Service Award one year. That's true, uh, uh, and I appreciate those awards. They're very gratifying to receive, uh, and uh, I look forward to members of my faculty who are now currently involved to receive similar awards. I expect that because uh, they're good people. You've had over 40 years in the field of anesthesiology, and uh, yeah, that's true. looking back over, <laughs> you were a founding member of a hospital in Dallas, and you've been founding member of, another, of other organizations and all. What would you say has been the biggest change in the space of anesthesiology in this 40-year period of time since you entered practice? The, when I came to Dallas to practice anesthesiology, I had in my armamentarium the following anesthetic agents. I had diethyl ether, cyclopropane, nitrous oxide for inhalation anesthesia. I had oxygen, of course. We did uh, regional conduction anesthesia, spinal blocks mostly. Did a lot of caudal blocks. Uh, when I came, we didn't have things like plastic catheters, uh, so, and those are new, little fine tubes that you can slide through needles and leave them pl implanted in the uh, body of the patient so that you could give incremental doses. Uh, they didn't even exist for placing little cannulas and veins. The uh, intravenous agents we had were, we had thiopental, and we had one muscle relaxant, which was uh, a, a crude form of curare. And that was anesthesiology at that time. Uh, all the uh, major anesthetic agents being explosive, we wore uh, conductive shoes, electrically conductive shoes, on electrically conductive floors. Uh, but then with time, uh, things improved. We got uh, potent uh, anesthetic agents that were not explosive, halothane particularly. Uh, we got some newer muscle relaxants uh, and uh, like succinylcholine. We had another one called decamethonium, which didn't last very long. And uh, things uh, changed. They improved quite a bit. The major thing that I think also took place was the monitoring of the patient during anesthesia. Uh, there was no monitoring as we understand it now. The patient was monitored by having his blood pressure taken and his pulse and respirations recorded. Uh, there were no automatic ventilators to put on the patient whose respirations were paralyzed. We had to do that by hand. Uh, every anesthesiologist developed wonderful muscles in his forearm. He looked like Popeye. Uh, those things came along uh, and uh, helped out uh, with the, uh, 
development of the non-explosive agents like halothane, uh, methoxyfluorine, and fluorine. We didn't have to wear conductive shoes. They didn't have to have conductive flooring in the operating suites. And we now had also much better monitoring devices. We had uh, uh, cardioscopes to monitor the electrocardiographic tracing on the patient. We had um, respirometers to measure the inspiratory pressure and the volume of uh, each breath on a tidal volume that during the anesthesia. And these were very helpful. Uh, special kinds of uh, monitors. I think the most beneficial one that we ever came across was one that didn't require batteries, wires, or anything like that, and that was the esophageal stethoscope. Uh, that was the, the ideal monitor. You could uh, hear the heartbeat and the uh, monitor respirations all at the same time through one ear and hear what's going on in the rest of the operating suite with your other ear. I thought it was the most efficient monitor there ever was. Uh, the equipment nowadays is much, much sophisticated. My first gas machine that I bought when I came to Dallas Osteopathic Hospital cost about $300, of which I, to which I applied about $1,000 worth of accessories. A standard piece of uh, uh, anesthesia equipment nowadays with the necessary monitors would run anywhere from thirty-five to fifty thousand dollars, and uh, definitely worth the, man, the money. Okay, there have been a lot of changes in anesthesiology, and uh, one organization that I know that uh, you've been very proud of since you are the founding member, really, and that's a group which is called SPASM. You want to tell us a little about the group SPASM and how historically they have evolved and. Uh, I think probably no other organization in our profession probably has had such a long extended run of uh, activity. SPASM is the acronym for the Society for the Prevention of Anesthetic and Surgical Misadventure. And we started it in 1957. And we have been meeting annually since then. We started with about six people in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, next November, we will have our 37th annual meeting. We expect in excess of 40 anesthesiologists and their guests to attend. This uh, organization is very successful because it's a non-organization. There's no constitution or bylaws, no offices, no elections, no meetings, no dues, no assessments. Uh, my role is once a year to select a fine restaurant to provide us a wonderful banquet, to select a speaker, and to select the menu. Uh, everything is voluntary there. The members that attend know that I will uh, apportion them their pro rata share of the, met of the uh, cost of the dinner, and that is it. The uh, honorarium for the guest speaker is uh, a token honorarium of a bottle of good brandy. And as I say, uh, we've been doing this now for 37 years, and it's uh, unique and very successful. Who have been some of the speakers you've had over the years for this program? We have had uh, many speakers from Southwestern Medical School. The first speaker we ever had was the uh, former chairman of the department, Dr. Pepper Jenkins. Uh, and uh, he came and spoke to us uh, more than once uh, in those early years, even though there was just a small group like six or seven of us. 25 years later, at our 25th anniversary, we invited him again, and he gave us an update on the talk that he had given us 25 years before. The succeeding uh, chairman of that department, Dr. Buddy Gieske, has spoken to the program at least three times, not too long ago, about three years ago. Uh, Dr. Ed Johnson, who runs the uh, operating suites uh, for the anesthesia department, has spoken at least three, four times. Um, Warner Allbrand, uh, who is now down at uh, 
uh, Texas A&M at the um, Scott, and Scott and White Hospital has spoken. Uh, and that department is being one of the premier uh, anesthesia departments in the allopathic profession has almost all the time provided our speakers. Uh, they are anxious and happy to uh, attend our program and uh, accept the, the modest uh, honorarium. Another question I'd like to pose to you, Dr. Stern, is regard to medical education in the profession. I noticed that you were director of medical education at Dallas Osteopathic Hospital for a period of time. And uh, how do you see the osteopathic profession in regard to when you were DME back in the, I guess, the 50s and 60s there, in regard to how we have our residency training programs now, and particularly into our postgraduate programs where they have internships leading into residency training program and what, have, what has been your uh, view of how the profession has advanced in regard to our postgraduate training program? Well, there's no comparison of today's programs to those programs. Uh, when I was director of medical education at Dallas Osteopathic Hospital, it was uh, a very haphazard thing. Uh, it was uh, more an administrative uh, function than even a teaching function. Uh, I did set up regular uh, lecture program for the interns. I was also involved in uh, residency training there. Uh, but the problem then, as it is now, is if you have too small a program, you can't make a good pro you can't make a good educational program out of it. Uh, fortunately, the small institutions, the small hospitals, have disappeared, and postgraduate education is now in the large institutions where a formal program can be structured. Uh, for example, uh, I had a resident at Dallas Osteopathic Hospital. I guess then he was the first <laughs> DO resident in training in Texas because that was even before I was certified as an, anesthesi uh, as, an, as an anesthesiologist and qualified to teach. But at that time, uh, certification in anesthesiology came, as, came through the Board of Surgery. Uh, and they really didn't have much influence on the uh, educational program for anesthesiology. Uh, a small program like that is a weak program. It's a weak program. My own program here, for example, I have uh, seven residents, and I send them to three of the local hospitals, two at a time. They spend six months apiece there. They work with a different set of surgeons in each place, a different clientele of patients, and they're trained in basically in three different manners. I also provide them with rotations elsewhere in those, function, in those subspecialty areas that I can't provide here. I send them to Baylor Medical College for four months and I send them to Denver Children's for two months for pediatric anesthesia. I can't provide that in this small program, so I make up for it by providing it elsewhere. And my residents are well received there uh, in these institutions, and uh, they get good training there too. So uh, if, you, if you don't have a large program or a program of decent size with qualified teachers, the program is not worth maintaining. I don't believe in it. Yeah, as far as Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine goes, you served in a number of different roles here. Not only have you been professor and chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology, but you've had a tenure as associate dean of clinical medicine, and you've had a number of other positions, which were at least in the area of committee work and all. What has brought you the greatest challenge that you've faced at Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine? I mean, what has been the biggest challenge you've faced since you became a full-time academic medicine specialist? Apart, I think my biggest challenge, of course, was my primary responsibility, which was to develop, to develop a really good instruction in anesthesiology. 
The importance of my course in anesthesiology, I shouldn't say my course, our department's course, is that when the students finish the course, they remember after they have left the, co the course is over, after they have graduated and gone elsewhere. Now I know this because graduates have told me this later on, and I've heard this from other anesthesiologists who have come in contact with our students. That has been, I think, my personally most gratifying uh, program. Uh, the residency program, yes, very much so. I'm very pleased with that. My other duties here at the school, uh, when I was appointed uh, as associate dean for specialty medicine, I effected some rather drastic changes that were called for and I think have been very successfully uh, rewarding. I, um, I'm responsible for cleaning out the pathology department and replacing it with an excellent faculty of pathology uh, members. I am responsible for uh, cleaning out the Department of Dermatology. And I also helped encourage the members of the radiology department to retire because their program was getting a bit archaic and they were not updating. We have replaced the radiology department with a very strong group of young, aggressive uh, faculty members. And I am still working to see that the new administration uh, fulfills my request for replacing the dermatology group. What's been your biggest uh, reward in regard to payoff in regard to accomplishments that you felt like that you've made here at Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine? Where has been your really payoff for you? Uh, personally, I've enjoyed it. I enjoy being at school very much, um, in spite of the fact that I drive every day from Dallas uh, to come here. Uh, it's been a very pleasant time for me. Uh, I enjoy being around the young people. Uh, and uh, It pleases me very much to uh, uh, see that they learn what we're trying to teach them. I'm also uh, pleased that uh, I have helped some of the students to take uh, their training, graduate training in other prestigious organizations, institutions, whether it's in anesthesiology or in other uh, specialty work. Uh, that uh, sense of uh, trust in me to help them is uh, gratifying too. I know when we go to the, like the AOCA meeting, we see many of our graduates there who are in the specialty who didn't train in our program. I know it does bring about a sense of satisfaction. We have put a lot of specialists out there in the field of anesthesiology that have trained at military and other allopathic as well as osteopathic programs. At a recent uh, meeting of the, uh, the uh, residency directors, uh, the statistics were produced there that our small department had produced a very high number of anesthesiologists uh, that have completed training and are in training, not only in this institution, but in other institutions, a very high percentage, in fact, higher than any of the other departments that are putting out uh, residency training. So that was a nice thing to hear. Okay. What do you see in the future for the Department of Anesthesiology, Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine? We've talked a lot about historically where we've come from, and where do you see the department going in the next decade? Currently, uh, due to circumstances beyond my control, we have uh, become strictly an academic program, uh, department. Uh, we are not actively uh, engaged in clinical practice directly concerned with the school. Our faculty members that train in the program are all practicing clinicians elsewhere. Uh, I would hope that within the next 10 years, we could develop a relationship with one of the local uh, t teaching hospitals, wherein the Department of Anesthesiology at that hospital would also be affiliated with the school 
and we would then have a direct clinical program locally, uh, much larger than the one that we have at uh, uh, OMCT, at Osteopathic Medical Center. Uh, the uh, members there of that department are very good members and have been faculty members, uh, both volunteer and uh, part-time. However, they are not part of the school's practice plan, and I would like to see a large department with a large practicing participating faculty group in the clinical, in the practice plan. Okay. We've asked you a lot of questions now, and any, any other thing that you'd like to add that uh, you feel like would be pertinent to the history of our Department of Anesthesiology or anything you feel like would be relevant in regard to our profession in re relation to the specialty of anesthesiology? I think we have uh, made a good contribution to our specialty in the osteopathic profession and uh, also just in the medical profession as far as our specialty is concerned. Uh, our uh, residents have been accepted into very prestigious institutions and that of course reflects well upon us. Uh, we've made a small contribution. I would like to see if we could grow into a very active clinically practicing department uh, and produce more in the way of scholarly activities, research and things like that. Uh, it's difficult to provide those things the way we are at this time. I think we've succeeded within the limitations that uh, proscribe our activities, but I would like to see it develop. Any other comments or any other additions you'd like to make that we have not covered during the interview that you feel like was important for us to preserve in regard to the history, at least the, the history of our Department of Anesthesiology here. It is an important year, 20 years. I think we've accomplished a great deal in 20 years and uh, I think it speaks well for you as well as the other members of the Department of Anesthesiology. Well, I don't know what else I would add. Um, I can't think of anything. I've told you of all the th things that I am uh, most proud of, and uh, I told you about my pleasure at being at school, and I don't know what else to add. Well, I'm sure it's been the school's pleasure to have you a member of our faculty, and uh, I know over the years that uh, you spent uh, between 1978 and 1992 here driving round trip between Dallas each day. I imagine you've, you've accumulated many hundreds of thousands of miles on your automobile during that period of time. and. And I say probably you have made a greater sacrifice than many of other faculty members to, to be a part of this institution. I think, too, the very fact that you've been in the practice of anesthesiology in Texas now for over 40 years, that's a lot of history in regard to our specialty of anesthesiology. And uh, I know that you have impacted me as well as many other anesthesiologists in the field in regard to our training and in regard to our affiliation with our Association of Anesthesiology, as well as our, our unique group SPASM, which again, I think has brought us a great deal of pleasure over the years. I think that has really accomplished a great deal in uh, creating the amity and cohesiveness of our small group of specialists that are spread out so far around here. Brings them back once a year, they redo their friendships, they make new friends, and uh, it's a very pleasant time. It's a very pleasant evening that we have. Uh, I'm pleased with that. And I'm sure all of us are looking forward to our meeting coming up next month for our SPAS meeting, the 37th year, right? That's right. The 37th year. It's been a pleasure to have Dr. Stern as our guest today in the oral history series. And uh, I think the contributions he's made to anesthesiology have been well elucidated today during our conversation. and. Uh, we're pleased to have him a member of our faculty, and I've been, been privileged to have him as my chairman for a number of years, and I know the school is uh, enthusiastic in their uh, support of Dr. Stern and the Department of Anesthesiology. We thank you for your appearance today, Dr. Stern. It was my pleasure. <laughs>